All righty. Um, well, friends, let's, uh, let's move into something that happened yesterday that was absolutely, utterly fantastic that I am so excited to talk about because really um, it's what God is doing here at St. James, and, um, and it's, it's very, very good. So yesterday, uh, St. James ministered with a ministry called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. This is a ministry, um, national ministry, actually, that um, Stan Self was saying he thinks is probably based out of Idaho, but there are many chapters across the nation, and uh, they have one locally near us in Madison. So uh, this is the, um, the leader of the ministry out of Madison from the Madison chapter of Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And what this is is this is a ministry where they build beds, through the help of churches that partner with them, they will build these bunk beds, single beds, and they will give them away to families who uh, don't have enough money to buy um, beds for their children. You all would be shocked at how many families, you know, fall into this category, completely blown away. Um, and, and there are many, in fact, over the last five years, they have constructed 500, excuse me, 300 beds, and uh, they have given them away. They, they'll go to a home, they'll take the pieces, the headboard, the footboard, the side rails, and they will set it up right there uh, for the family so that the kids don't have to sleep on the couch or on sleeping bags on the floor anymore. Um, now, this next shot, what they'll do is they'll come to your church like they did yesterday morning. So yesterday, we had about 40 people over here on the St. James campus who were all working together. It was an awesome day of serving Jesus in the morning. So um, they'll do everything uh, for you in terms of making the ministry just work so well. They bring the power drills. They bring um, the, let's say they bring the, the screwdrivers, they bring the sanders and the saws and everything else, along with the lumber, too. So here's a look at um, some of our sanders that were underneath the portico. Now, this was actually very interesting because um, the, the sound, it sounded very similar when the sanders were going at it. Because, see, they didn't want for the children or the adults to take the, the beds and move them around in the room and get splinters all in their hands, so they sand them down really nice that are really good and smooth. But it sounded like the largest swarm of bees you've ever heard in your life. There was this bzzz going on right for two and a half or three hours. And I thought, you know, you could, if you were over at Beachwood Shopping Center, you could probably hear them over there. I mean, it was this incredible sound. Um, that was coming out. Here's another look at the Sanders, and boy, they were going at it, too. They did a great job. Gary, you were one of them. Y'all did a great job with those boards. I'm telling you, I didn't get a single splinter in my hands when I was over there helping to, uh, to do some drilling. So here we have, you see a lot of folks spread out on, on the um, driveway here, and what they were doing was, when they got the sanded board, they would then drill holes in the end of it, and also in certain sections of the wood, and then they would start uh, screwing pieces of wood together so they could make the side rails, and even, um, I believe Elizabeth Price was helping with this. She was carrying the wood to this little vat that you'll see in just a moment where it'd be stained. But here's our group, and they are taking the, the wood that has now been sanded, that has been drilled, that the screws have gone in, and they are putting together headboards and footboards. So here you have, like, Daniel Butler, John Morris... Next slide, you'll see there's Patrick Lee, who we just prayed for, and also Ronnie Howard. They're working on a, they're, they're drilling down, screwing in the, the headboard there. Now, this is, was really interesting here, I thought. Um, you see these ladies are smiling. What they have is um, they would get the headboards and the footboards, and they would submerge them in this liquid that you see. This is actually vinegar that's mixed with, get this, steel wool that would dissolve in the vinegar. And so what they were doing is, you'll see this next one, watch this, because it's, it's actually below the liquid now. They brought it up, that's the headboard. 
So what it does is it's a stain. So they didn't want just simply the, the, the very light pine wood. They wanted to put this kind of a really nice reddish stain on there to kind of dress it up a little bit. So they take it out, and then they um, put it out there and where it dries, and then it's all loaded up. But I, I like what it says there. No kid sleeps on the floor in our town. So you see some of us, and we are, we are wearing this um, because, you know, I, I really believe that, that we can partner with them in an ongoing way. They would like to establish an Athens chapter here, and I believe we have the capability of helping them with that so that, uh, and the fun part is, is that after you build the beds like we did yesterday, and according to Jimmy Neer, who works with our trustees and our discernment team, Jim said that we constructed about 15 bunk beds and 30 single beds. So a lot of those things, they are taken together. And the fun thing is, is that when you get a team of volunteers, and I'm looking at some of the volunteers, you all are volunteering, you just don't know it yet, um, <laughs> that when you volunteer to help, you can take the beds to like a home whenever we identify where the homes are that would like to get a bed or beds for their children, and you get to set it up there in the home, and it's just really a great moment because the family is so appreciative, and it is, a, I mean, it is pure evangelism because Jesus said, let your light shine, and you've heard me say before, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving, and when you give somebody something from your heart to theirs, Boy, it makes an impact in Jesus. And Jesus uses that in a very powerful way to show them that, hey, God is thinking of them and God is targeting them with his love. And, and they don't forget that. So um, anyway, it was, a, it was a really, really wonderful day that we had. So thank you all for all those. Uh, oh, that will come in just a moment. Okay, all right. I'll tell you about that one. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at the, at the scripture here from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, what you find here in the, in the word from Deuteronomy 8 is, is that Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. They have been for four centuries in Egypt, for four decades in a desert, and now God, God is telling them through Moses, Guess what, guys? God is about to change your life. You're going to go into an area which would be current-day Israel. You're going to be taken to this land where everything's going to change for you. You're going to um, go into this place where you have so much of everything. And the key lesson that Moses wanted them to be sure to understand was this. He was essentially saying, never forget... Never forget to remember God. Because you're going into a land where you're going to have so much water. There would be pools. There would be streams. There would be rivers there and, and, uh, and streams. There would be so much food in the fields. Wheat and barley. I mean, there would just be crops galore that they would have. Also, um, they would find more fruit in Israel than they'd get in a Kroger that we can find with the grapes and the figs and the, and the olives too. There'd be so much bread. There'd be so much house that they could live in. They would have nice houses that were coming as a result of God's blessing on their life. They would have so many um, animals in their fields. They would have so much money in their bank account. And, and here the key part was, was that what Moses was concerned about was this. Don't let the so much become too much. That's essentially, he didn't use those exact words, but that's what he was saying. Because in verse 14 of, of that chapter, of, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, here's what you find Moses really uh, keys in on and... Deuteronomy 8, listen to these words here. 
Be careful that your heart, when you have, all, when you have so much, be careful. And by the way, this is a, a word for you and I as Americans because there's never been a country in the history of the world that has had so much as we do. It's unbelievable, and we're so blessed. It's, it's good. But we need to make sure that the blessings that we have inherited don't become curses because they easily can. So Moses is saying, hey, listen, when you get all this, when you get so much, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud, meaning that you think that, okay, hey, man, I've got all that I do because I've worked hard. I have all this because I'm so talented. I have all this because of so-and-so pointing back to self. He says, make sure that you don't become proud and you don't, watch this, you don't forget the Lord your God. You don't forget who it all came from. And that's a real easy thing for you and I to do where we have so much around us. Y'all, think about it. There, there's so much Netflix, there's, there's so much ESPN, there's so much entertainment with movies. There's so much sports that we have, guys, that we love with the football and the basketball and the UGA baseball and the World Series, I think, that's playing right now. Right, Stan, the College World Series? Um, and we, we've got so much shopping on Amazon. We've got so much clothes that you can go in any of these department stores. Gosh, we have so much, and it's so easy in the so much to let the so much become too much. And by the way, when so much becomes too much, it will hurt us much. Because we will blank out and we will start thinking of God less and less and all these things around us that distract us away more and more. Well, in Cuba, where I was about a week and a half ago, they don't worry about the so much becoming too much because they don't have so much of anything. It, it's um, in Cuba their economy has been absolutely devastated for decades by this, this form of government and, and economy. Basically, it's, it's, um, it's communistic socialism is what it is, where the government, Big Brother, gives you everything. It's failed miserably. It does not work. I just pray, I pray to God, God, don't ever let us be cursed by that where we become like that, where we become so dependent on government for everything. Politicians would love that. You do understand that, right? Because they really would love to control you. And they would say everybody's going to be equal on, a, on an equal plane. Well, I've seen that in Cuba. It does not work because you're always going to have a big dog on the block. That's the government who makes all the decisions for your life. And it's a disaster. So, but in this place where there is so little in Cuba, guess what? The church in the last 25 years has grown by 500%. So I sat in the living room of, uh, of this couple right here. And by the way, they are standing, um, you'll hear more about this next week, but they are standing in what they hope will become their parsonage one day. There's just, there's just mounds of dirt and grass that you see there right now, and uh, they're standing kind of like in the bones of what should have been a house um, 10 years ago, but they didn't have any money, and uh, the building project's just been sitting there unfinished. Um, but anyway, it's amazing what you can build in Cuba. You can actually build a house for them for $16,000. And I think Madison, a church down in Madison, has already committed 10000 So anyway, we're going to try to raise a little bit of money for them. But their names are Adady, Adady and Tanya. So I was asking them, I said, uh, guys, how do y'all stay hungry for God? Because that's the key factor in the revival that has been going on in Cuba since the late 1980s. You'll, again, you'll hear more about that next week, so come back. But um, this revival has been going on for at least 35 years. Well, what Bob Beckwith has realized is, because he's done a lot of ministry with the Fawesti Foundation down in Jamaica. Well, Jamaica is a very poor country. 
like Cuba. So you have poor Christians in Jamaica, you have poor Christians in Cuba. It's not the poverty that makes them desperate for God. Because in Jamaica, you don't see that hunger for God. But in Cuba, it's explosive. So I asked them, what keeps y'all hungry? And, and one of the ingredients of the secret sauce, so to speak, that Jesus has, has cooked up for them, that they have just been living out of, is this phenomenal life of prayer. Where they live by prayer. Their life is a song of prayer. We sang family prayer song. Yeah, that, that's literally what they do in Cuba. So um, what I heard from this couple is this. Um, they, they, they always seek to connect their life with God. So from, at 5.30, from Tuesday through Saturday, five days a week, I want you to imagine if we start doing this here, they invite the church, and in their living room, which is right next door to this thing, they, they live in a, in a parsonage, and their, their church is also in the parsonage. Um, they invite the believers of the church to come over. So about eight or nine of them come over around 5.30 in the morning, and they pray for an hour and a half, five days a week. Are you awake at 5.30? Are you praying at 5.30? <laughs> if y'all would like to start this, let me know. Um, but, but they're doing this uh, five days a week. Then on Saturday, what they do is they start accelerating the wave of prayer. So they'll pray for an hour and a half on Saturday morning, really, really early, 537. But then they'll have another time of prayer where they say, okay, y'all, the church, y'all can come out in greater force than this. And they will have about 40 to 50 people, like we had 40 people here yesterday. And they come out to pray. They don't come out simply to build beds. They would do that too. But they come out to pray every single Saturday for two to three hours. Then on Sunday morning they get together and they're praying for another hour and a half before their worship service. And I said, do y'all see God do you know, anything as a result of this? And they say, all the time. All the time. It's, it's normal there. For example, one time uh, when they were worshiping in the parsonage, they, um, their worship space is in the garage. So they don't park the cars in the garage. That's their church now, in the garage. And they've kind of fixed it up a little bit so it looks kind of nice, you know, and they can get about 100 and 120 people in their garage packed in. But they'll open up the doors of the garage so that when people are coming by, and they live on a busy intersection, when people come by um, on their bikes or they're walking, and um, they'll hear the praise music from inside. They'll hear the preaching, the reading of Scripture. Well, um, there was this lady who was on a bike one day, they said, as church was going on. And she was coming down the, the incline, coming down the hill where the street is, and, and as she was coming down the hill, all of a sudden her bike stopped but she didn't put on the brakes because there was an earthquake. And the ground was shaking, and, and she, was, she was freaked out by it because her bike just stopped right in front of the house where they were worshiping. And she looked around, and she didn't see any other structures falling down, and, and all of a sudden she realized this shaking is coming from that house there where all this stuff is taking place. Well, when she walked in, people were not jumping up and down. They weren't a 1,000 pounds apiece, and they weren't shaking the ground because of that. Um, it was simply the presence of God that was causing this vibration. And she realized this isn't an earthquake. What we know is it was a faith quake. And there's actually a parallel that you find from Acts 4, I believe it's Acts 4.31, where Peter and the other believers, they are praying, and the scripture says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. The ground started moving, and it was from the presence of God. And they were all filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happens down in Cuba. In Cuba, they're 
so much doesn't become too much because they don't have so much, but they do have so much God. And, and y'all, in order to have more God in your life, what you and I have to do is live at the bottom of that. At the bottom of the cross where we exhibit beautiful self-denial, where we deny our just our carnal wants that do not always line up with God's perfect and good will for your life and for mine. And we do whatever it takes, we sacrifice, and we say, you know what, God, I'm going to be more serious in the life of prayer, I'm going to be more serious about the Bible study, I'm going to be more serious in being a witness for Jesus. And stop living, in, looking in the mirror, but looking at all the lost souls that I work with, that are, okay, not, I don't work with lost souls, okay, everybody here is saved, okay, but just go with it, because, because, <laughs> Before I called it, it was called the ministry. I used to work in a place where there weren't a lot of saved people. So, but but how much are you living to say, Jesus, I'm yours, and Jesus, use me, so they will know that you are real. That's what we do now. Ugh, I'm I'm in a hard place right now. Do you know why? Because I've got so much sermon left to preach. And so few seconds left to deliver it in. And so, because it's Father's Day, I, I, I did this at the 9 o'clock service. I'm going to just hit time out right here, and I'm going to unload the rest of it on you next week, okay? So it'll be good. It'll be healthy for your souls. So come back. Bring somebody with you. Um, but right now, we're going to move into our time of singing some songs before we dismiss. So, uh, Brian, you've got something cooked up good for us. I know you and the praise team do. Um, so, Father's, happy Father's Day to you. We're glad you're here. Thank you for bringing your, uh, thank you for bringing your kids to church where God can grab them and God can shape them and God can mold them because they are the next generation and we want them to live well in God. All right. Well, uh, would you pray with me? And then we'll sing a song and then we'll take off, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so Almighty Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for our leaders up here on stage. I thank you for, for the Johnnies and the Garys, God, and, and, and the Gretchens and the Shannons and, and Terrys and, and everybody here. Bless them, God, because they live by faith, not by sight. Bless us. God, just like you have put revival in the hearts of people in Cuba, um, God, I pray that you do the miracle in our hearts because there is so much around us and we just confess the sin of God being, being enamored and just being distracted away by the so much of everything. And, and God, it just pulls our hearts away from you. and We don't even realize it. And we're not trying to get distance from you but we just do it happens forgive us God for those ways that we yield inappropriately to other things because God even when there are good things around us if that's all we're swimming in the good thing can become a bad thing when there's no Jesus in it so help us God help us help us Jesus Fill us with your spirit and keep us kneeled with both knees planted in the dirt of the ground right underneath the shadow of the cross. And it is in Christ we pray these things. Amen.